Hey guys, this is gonna be my analysis video for TI-11 for the third place finishers, Team Liquid. We're gonna be talking about the types of drafts that they had, the roles of each player on the team, and also giving some brief insight onto their gameplay and what made them get third place in terms of good things that beat most of the teams in the tournament, but also some of the reasons why they may have fallen short uh, in regards to getting second or first. So let's go ahead and get started. Banana slam giant. So first and foremost, I want to show you guys the drafts for Team Liquid uh, later on in the International, specifically against Aster, uh, as well as Team Secret. Uh, for the sake of analysis, we'll also be looking mainly into the Aster games to show you guys what they did successfully. Um, you'll see more about Team Liquid uh, in regards to what they did unsuccessfully in the Secret analysis video coming out tomorrow, because that's part of the win we're going to analyze. <laughs> So today we're going to be mainly focused on the Team Liquid vs. Aster series, but we do need to kind of notice the pattern that Team Liquid has for their drafting. So let's kind of just break it down from player to player uh, by role of the types of heroes they play and the role they fit in. So first off, in Insania's role, we see Lich, Crystal Maiden, Undying, Lich, Jakiro, Undying. Pretty much all of his hero pool was lane dominators that also looked to rotate to the runes. So the reason why that that was so important for Liquid was that they wanted to get some early momentum in their safe lane. Most of their safe lanes were winning in terms of just uh, Matu's net worth compared to the offlaner's net worth. That would then allow them to predominantly play around the mid lane, as we'll get to later when we mention Mike, who was really the carry of their team. So that was how Insania played in lane dominators who could rotate onto runes. Next up, we have Boxy, who flourished on low cooldown skirmish heroes, with some pickoff potential. We're looking at Marcy, Tusk, 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 Tusk. I know he only played Tusk and Marcy in these last few series, but he kind of, he just had so much more success on these low cooldown consistent hunters than he did on the likes of like Earthshaker. Um, heroes that are cooldown based, ultimate based heroes. So Boxy having playmaking potential and rotating potential to the runes as well was ultra important for Liquid's success getting third place. Zai. Uh, in the three position, he was much more of a sacrificial hero for this team because of the fact that they put a lot of emphasis on lane dominators for Insania, and also they gave a lot of their mid-game attention to Mike. Zai was the one usually operating on food stamps as well as pretty much on his island, you know? Um, there were games that Zai had high net worth, but that was often when he was playing Broodmother, uh, a hero that can function very well with very little help. So we see Broodmother, Leshrac, Pangolier, Enigma, Broodmother, and in the last game, Brewmaster. If we kind of compare games where they were successful, it was oftentimes Zai, one of the lowest net worths in the game, come around like 15, 20 minutes. Example, this Pangolier game that we're going to be watching, he was poverty mode. But his ability to have high impact with very few items and very few resources dedicated to him was essential to Liquid uh, making it to top three. Coming in at the two position, Mike, who was basically their carry player. You know, last year he did play carry, but in terms of how much attention he was given on the map, he was the carry for Team Liquid. Uh, Lena was his standout hero, as you see him picking her three times in these games. And then pretty much everything else feel like it fell flat except for Tiny, which uh, is a very nice scaling mid as well. He played that like a carry. You know, he actually went safe lane in this game, specifically to give the Sniper vs. Quap matchup mid, but he ended up going like Blink, Echo Saber, BKB, a very scale-heavy, carry-esque build. Um, and you can see, based on our analysis video from yesterday, we talked about how it was really hard to engage into the opponent during this meta. So the heroes that can kind of like stand their ground and dish out the damage, or basically ambush the opponent, like the Tusks and the Tinies, those are the go-tos. So we see success on Lina's and Tinies, but we don't see success on heroes that have to go in, you know, the Storms, the Primal Beasts. And in this case, while they did pick Lina and they fell short, uh, it was a lot to do with the fact that Secret was constantly locking him down with Invoker and Earthshaker. So, Matu playing much more of a two-position role. He was almost like another offlaner uh, for Team Liquid, the way his hero operated in the game. Uh, he was often later picked in the draft, you can see here. Uh, most of the 10th picks are him, four out of the final six. 
And if it wasn't the final pick, it was a life stealer. So it's pretty much life stealer or 10th pick for Matu. And even though life stealer is a traditional carry, um, I definitely would say this Morphling game just simply doesn't count. Uh, I don't think they had a better pick, and it, you can definitely tell Matu did not feel comfortable playing the one role. Like, he was not feel- it did not look like he was comfortable playing the map in a way where he took all the farm. And by no means is Matu not able to do that. It's just that on this team, you know, if you've been playing the same way all tournament, and then one game you're told, hey, you're playing like a one this game. It's like, okay. It definitely, definitely felt very lackluster, and for the sake of that, we're not going to really analyze game two. Like, this game two of Team Liquid versus Aster just straight up looked like- completely out of the comfort zone of Team Liquid and what they represented for this tournament. But yeah, so Matu, oftentimes, like, his hero allowed Mickey's hero to do its job. And I think why Lifestealer was so important is simply the infest, as well as, like, the assassination. Like, he's basically a pickoff hero that can also pseudo-save by infesting. And Lifestealer is an amazing hero for leaving alone in his safe lane pretty early on which then allows Insania to rotate around the map. The really cool pick we'll be looking into today was the Night Stalker carry. I mean, that just kind of says enough, right? Like, all these heroes that Matu picked are not real carries, especially how he played them during the game. So we'll definitely be talking about that a lot in this analysis. So that's where each player on Team Liquid came in. I want to give a brief summary of why I think they got third before we look at their games. So I feel like Team Liquid, out of the final four teams was actually the only team that was going against the grain of what I called the meta in my analysis yesterday. The meta we basically talked about was that you have Wraith Pact, you have Pipe, these being like two of the most bought items, especially by the offlaners. And a lot of this meta was really hard to engage into the opponent. And a lot of the final teams were just picking tanky guys in front, summons or illusion heroes to throw units at the opponent, and then a ranged damage dealer sitting in the back. That's really hard to engage into. And I feel like Liquid was the only team out of the final four that never did that. Uh, the one game they won against Secret, they actually did do that. They had the summons hero and then they 10th picked sniper for Matu. Um, um, and that was the one game that they won. Um, I feel like their strategy revolved around how good they were at moving around the map as five, as well as how good they were at engaging teamfights. That's what we're going to be highlighting um, from Team Liquid's games versus Aster. Because if you look at Aster's drafts, they definitely fit that mold, right? Underlord, tanky guy, backliner, sniper, doing damage. Uh, summons, tanky guy, backliner, drow, doing damage. So all this series of Team Liquid vs. Aster was, was Aster holding high grounds, sitting in a five-man ball that Team Liquid had to break, and no one up until Team Liquid had really been able to break it that well. And I do actually think that the five-day break between the final four teams playing and the rest of the playoffs was a big part of why Team Liquid was actually able to come up with the strats to do this. Because when we look at this series versus Astra, you can tell that they knew exactly how Astra was going to play. And they had carefully crafted maneuvers on the map that allowed them to take the fights that they needed to against Aster. And I think that even though they did their game plan insanely well on Team Liquid, I really don't think their game plan fit the meta at all. Like they played their own meta but it's like, it only goes so far. It's like, if you're really good at what you do, but what you do is not technically the optimal strat in a meta, that's like a recipe for getting third at TI. So that's what we're going to see here. So let's go ahead and jump into the Team Liquid uh, versus Aster games, just to basically put examples and pictures to what I just spieled for you guys. So first and foremost, I'd like to highlight the net worth distribution at 10 minutes for Team Liquid. Uh, this was actually a lot of their games. They would have Matu and Mickey way up here. And then Zai was almost always the third in net worth, pretty much given no attention as we talked about. And there were a lot of games where we're going to see in the game three of this series as well, where it's literally Matu and Mickey up here, and the rest of Liquid all the way down here. So they really did play like a hard two-core lineup that revolved around Zai having a hero that would have impact with no items. And I felt like there were games where Zai played Leshrac, um, so there was an exception made specifically for Leshrac, who's a very farm-heavy hero that they could play in the offlane. But this was really the standard for them across most of their games. So a lot of the mid-game team fights for Team Liquid were just four-man engagements, where Zai is kind of playing on his own island. In this case, he's specifically respawning. But they incorporated him very little into these fights. As you see, Zai would almost always be in the offlane area, playing like a summons area controlling type hero. And the rest of Liquid would be taking fights mainly around the mid lane. This was where most of their fights occurred. Uh, in this case, it's specifically for a rune. 
But as you can see, what the Lich offers, as similar to the Undying that they played a lot, is that it basically makes this squishy hero, the Lina, uh, that's high damage output, below survivability, be able to pseudo frontline in these fights and kind of like stand their ground. The Marcy plays a huge role in that because of the fact that Marcy supplies the lifesteal, which is like a pseudo satanic. A lot of fights started this way. Look at how Aster tries to engage into them. When Liquid initiated the fight, Matu rotates in with a hero that prevents them from running away. That really is the recipe for Matu's heroes, Night Stalker, Life Stealer, uh, Bloodseeker. And so that was pretty much how every mid-game fight went. If you watch Liquid's games, is Mickey and Boxy starting the action, Matu and Insania rotating in, and the respective roles being fit in the fight. So Liquid's lineups generally operated on very low cooldowns. So what they would do in regards to seizing the map from the opponent team was play a very invasive, constant uptime playstyle where if they got like one or two kills on you, they would generally snowball that or attempt to snowball that into even more kills. So in this case, they took down the Spearbreaker and the Leshrac who overextended top. And this is like a very standard maneuver by Liquid where they, you know, they don't take this as an opportunity to farm. They take this as an opportunity to go for more and to invade uh, the opponent's side of the map. So they're going to smoke up away from Zai once again, who's playing on his own side of the map. Matu is going to rotate into the fight late. And they're going to kill the sniper in his triangle. And the funny thing about this fight specifically is the only reason Zai ends up showing up is that Underlord used a portal. So Zai is just going to walk through it to get there. Matu rotating in, rotating in later. And this is the type of thing that Liquid was very good at doing. Overwhelming you with superior numbers, high mobility on their heroes, and constant quick decisions that allowed them to effectively invade where you normally would be difficult to do so into a hero like Sniper, um, especially if the opponent's set up for it. Zai was... His heat map is going to be this area for, like, the entire early game. That's, like, a pretty standard Broodmother thing, but he also does the same thing on Enigma... And it was kind of just the offlane meta to play a summons hero who can, who took the bottom tower and then controlled the enemy jungle. And the way Liquid would play the map is that most of their engagements were away from this. You saw a top rune, triangle, they got pickoffs up here. But then once Zai got his first item, either the Wraith Pact or the Pipe, Liquid would then begin to play around him. So you see here, Zai just finished his pipe. And now Liquid has brought all five heroes to the bottom half of the map. Usually they'll try to take either a favorable engagement or force some relevant pressure on the tier two tower in order to take over the outpost. So they don't really force anything in the sense that they don't really look for pickoffs around this. Um, they generally make sure they control this area, force a reaction, and then smoke away from it. This is something that they did a lot, especially on Dire because they are concerned about Roche rather than being concerned more so about this tower. So kind of the same idea here where they're trying to invade again, but it was uh, this time Aster was a bit better set up but still like the same idea as before, right? They're just including Zion on the play because of this early teamfight item that he has. So they usually they use they turn this into more map control, looking to take Roshan, and uh, in this case, Zai actually overextends. Um, and this is what would happen sometimes, is that Liquid would stay a little bit too long in the area that they took over. These were pretty common for their feeds, I would say, like their costly deaths in the games that I watched were invade, take a good fight, try to steal some farm, stay a little bit too long, and then lose a crucial hero, in this case, Zai. In regards to map play, since we've been highlighting mainly team fights and the way that they execute ganks, Mickey and Boxy were pretty much always connected. Like, these two were almost always a kill combo. You know, we saw a lot of Marcy and Tusk from uh, Boxy, who are like really good plus one heroes. You know, like, usually these two heroes plus one other hero will be kills, and that hero was pretty much always Mickey. And this is something that would very commonly happen for Liquid. Zai would be playing his own area. Matu was usually taking the more defensive farm. And then Boxy and Mickey were like the kill squad on the map. This is pretty much every two-man kill from Liquid were these two players. Uh, and it always had Hero with a stun on Boxy, Hero with burst damage on Mickey. So immediately after they get this kill on Leshrac, the same idea as what I said before, uh, where Broodmother died in the triangle, um, trying to invade a little bit too much. This is pretty much all of Liquid's mistakes that I saw, where in this case they use the BKB on Mickey in order to secure the Leshrac kill, and they're going to try to turn this kill that they got, um, similar to up here, into too much, 
right? So in this case, they're going to try to force the bottom tier 2 tower with in a spot where it's pretty difficult, seemingly, for Aster to defend. But Aster knows that Mickey has no BKB. They're going to stay a little bit too long, not quite in position to protect him. And I would say Liquid very rarely ever fed on the map. They almost always caught the opponent off guard in regards to ganks. But for whatever reason, they kind of insisted on pushing too much afterwards. They didn't seem to know their limits on how much they could capitalize on individual plays and kills. And this was often what would happen. And teams like Astra are just insanely good um, at seizing areas and taking it back from you. Like, they're like, we control this area, not you. Um, and Aster's very good at recognizing their times to do that. So after Aster killed Liquid in the bottom lane, they managed to snowball that into a tower and also a Roshan. And that's going to kind of like institute the status quo for the rest of this series uh, that we can kind of pay attention to. Pretty much happened at like 20 minutes, 25 minutes every single time is the way Aster liked to play. And the basically what Liquid had to defeat, we kind of talked about that in our analysis of Liquid. Aster's pretty much going to run around the map as four or five, always including the Underlord and the Sniper, basically being this death ball that is attempting to take objectives. And what's really important about this is how Liquid decides to engage into this, because it's seemingly very difficult, and also which objectives they choose to confront them. Not only how they take the fight, but where they decide to take the fight. So we're just going to kind of like fast forward as you see like what Aster is going to do. They're just going to run around the map, and Liquid's going to willingly give up certain objectives, where they're just taking trades on the map, um, potentially getting a tower of their own, sometimes in this case not, but they're just totally content saying, hey Aster, we're going to let you walk around as four, this is like a very scary uh, death ball that you've got here. And they're actually going to evade the smoke from Aster. Like, they're not going to attempt to fight it. They're just backing off, playing very passively. They know Aster's all missing. And notice how Liquid does this a lot. They just mirror the opponent. Part of uh, the way they play that's so good is not just that they're choosing to give you a tower, but they're also predicting, like, now that Aster's got this tower... They're not just going to go straight high ground. They're going to go for their next tier two tower, which is down here. And we're just going to mirror it, right? We're just going to flip the map, you know? So Aster plays one side of the map and Liquid chooses to mirror it. So the reason why this pretty much happened in most of Liquid's games was because the opponent's five man was almost always stronger than Liquid's. Like the way Liquid drafted, their five man was really never that strong. Um, like none of these heroes other than maybe Lich Ulti are what I would call team fighters, right? So, the reason why um, it's so important that Liquid's good at this is because if they took a head-on engagement on Aster's terms, where Aster's just walking around and they fight into them, it's just not going to work. Because Aster has much better AoE, team fight, auras, uh, damage, all that kind of stuff. So the fact that Liquid is able to like predict, hey, they're going to take this tower, we're going to flip it, then after that tower they're going to move here and we're going to flip the map again. Um, Liquid is like very fluid about the way they play the map. Pun intended. So in the mid game for Liquid, there was a lot of this dodge game going on. You know, the opponent team dictating what part of the map they controlled and Liquid willingly taking the other half. It did lead to the opponents getting a lot more Roches than Liquid um, because the opponent usually chose to play around Roche. But it all comes down to when Liquid was going to decide to take these fights. Notice how they're pretty much just saying, hey, Sniper, you have Aegis. Um, Underlord, we're not going to we're not going to engage into you at all. Right. Every time Aster makes a move on mid, they retreat to top. Every time Aster's bottom, Liquid's top, and vice versa. Just looking to trade again, same idea. It's important that when Aster flips the map, that Liquid responds as quickly as possible. And since they're not in control of the game, or where the map is being played, they're not really getting full trades out of it, but they're generally forcing somebody from Aster back, or at least poking down the towers, right? So in this case, Sniper's Aegis is going to expire in 20 seconds. So pretty much the entirety of the Aegis timer, Liquid just avoids them. Um, and this happened in pretty much every Liquid game. But at the exact moment that they think they're capable of taking a fight, it's all about how Liquid took the fights. So the fact that they forced this tower uh, when Aster was pushing Tier 2, and forcing a reaction such as Spearbreaker, is pretty crucial to the success of this team. They were always forcing the opponent to separate, um, even if it's just for a bit. And they generally read that pretty well, even though they don't see the Spearbreaker. If you push this tower like this, you can kind of predict that something like that's going to happen. Um, and then they take the fight right at the tail end of the Aegis. Rupturing Ori, who perhaps was a bit overextended. And even though um, they don't actually get a kill here, they manage to successfully uh, ward Aster off of their base. And now that the Aegis is out, 
it looks like it's time to fight for Liquid, right? They're going to basically say Aster's going to disperse. Leshrac, no BKB. It's now time to fight. They immediately connect with Alina, who defended bottom with her Boots of Travel, taking a fight with favorable numbers because Aster's still split up, punishing the fact that Leshrac has no BKB. And this is how Liquid took every fight. They are really good at playing the map, right? Forced somebody to play here, pushed Aster away from here. Aster used a BKB and some crucial cooldowns and immediately uh, fought afterwards. So even though they don't have the teamfight lineup um, that you would think you'd want to have to take teamfights, you can see that every fight that it goes Liquid's way is Aster not properly grouped up because they just dispersed to farm after taking an objective and then Liquid punishing it accordingly. The fight that's going to happen is a very important comparison to one that's going to happen later in this game. And we're going to see that the way Liquid approaches these fights is very important. Pretty much every fight for Liquid, the opponent was going to be set up in some way, and Liquid has to invade them. So whether it's because the opponent is caught off guard, not ready for it, or perhaps the way that Liquid approaches their attack is the important factors that go on here. So Aster's doing a very standard move. Roche is going to be respawning in the next couple minutes. They've placed a ward on the high ground here and here. And they're just basically going to sit here until Roche responds, right? They're just going to sit here controlling this area, pushing top, cutting mid. This is like a very standard maneuver. Um, and in this series specifically, especially, Aster's lineup was always the one doing this. And Liquid's job was always to invade this. So Liquid's going to pick a fight where they want this area back. And whether or not this is correct is tough to say in regards to, like, you know, maybe it's a bit too early because Roche still isn't spawning for two minutes. But it's all about how they take the fight. So Boxy is going to get smoked up, or he is smoked up. I guess it's a replay bug. And what's going to happen is Aster's going to be over here. And it's like, with bird's eye view, hindsight 2020, if they're camped up here with a high ground reward here and a high ground reward here, Aster's most likely going to have somebody to break the smokes here and potentially somebody to break the smokes over here. They, you know, they don't know that. So if we were, like, perfectly executing this, we would at least want to walk this way and perhaps do, like, an entire loop around to, like, flank Aster from the other side. Because Aster just saw Liquid around here. So they kind of know, like, if Liquid's coming, it's from somewhere over here. What's going to happen, though, is Boxy is going to break his smoke right here. You can't see it, but he breaks his smoke on XSS. XSS sees him. Boxy's no longer smoked. And he's going to just decide to try to take this outpost back, right? And this is a fight where Aster now smoked up and took it on their own terms, got the initiation onto Boxy, which has not been the recipe for all of their success. It's always Boxy getting the initiation on them. And this is going to be a failed attempt at Liquid invading. And it really came down to the fact that Boxy tried to take this path, a bit of a shorter path, and broke his smoke. So now Aster had full information that when they see a smoked Marcy break in their vision, that all of Team Liquid is here. So the whole idea of having these superior numbers, the superior jump, the one time that they didn't do that, Aster just kind of wipes them, right? Liquid ends up taking a fight after and it goes very poorly. Aster retains control and that's going to lead to Aster getting yet another Roche. So Aster actually has not gotten Roche yet. It just respawned. They're in the pit and Liquid's all respawned and missing. And Liquid actually changes up their approach. It's a really cool change because they recognize like Aster's missing and they could be in Roche, they could be up here, they know they control this area. Maybe we're not strong enough to engage them directly. So Liquid's actually gonna smoke up and take the other hill around Roche. Aster's controlling this one willingly. Liquid doesn't feel strong enough to contest it directly where they just walk into them. So the best thing you can do is take a high ground around Roche. Aster chose the dire one and Liquid was like, okay, I guess we'll just take the radiant one. So they're actually going to sit on this high ground and actually do a full reach around, wrap around, to get their own ward up here. So I actually like this move a lot because Zai took mid lane or put some pressure on it, forcing Aster to split up a little bit. Um, and Liquid's now sitting on their own ward um, rather than fighting into Aster's ward. Aster scans it with a gem so they fully know it's there. But this is like a really cool adjustment mid game from Liquid. Realizing that fighting directly into Aster up a hill is just not exactly in their... Uh, power they don't have something they don't have the power to do that um but even then like aster still kind of holds the upper hand i think liquid's doing their best to minimize that advantage from aster but as we keep fast forwarding like liquid's just going to keep cutting mid and top forcing um making sure that aster's not getting like free tower damage in the meantime right cutting mid cutting top everything liquid does is just mirroring the opponent letting them have control of the area that they want to have and this time around they're going to jump ori 
and actually take an engagement that's in their favor because Ori was showing on the mid wave, which was really cool. Nice save from Boxy. But despite the fact that they seemingly got a good trade off this, they never actually engaged into Aster's five man uh, full on. They only got a pick off. And Aster's still going to turn that into Roche because they still control this area. Liquid's going to try to invade again with a the smoke. They actually got a high ground D ward. Still controlling the Roche area. Flesh actually buys back. And now we're going to have some crazy engagement where both teams recognize the importance of the second Roche. I don't know why I keep saying Aster got Roche. It's almost like I wasn't prepared. And this is the kind of chaotic fight that Liquid needs in order to have a somewhat even engagement. Buybacks all across the board. Kind of just utter chaos. Monet dropping super low, sustaining somehow. Mickey is going to go down. Monet is barely going to survive. He's actually then going to drop to the buyback of Marcy coming in hot. But then he's going to buy back and force the Roshan. And this all stems from the fact that Aster has been controlling this area for like 10 minutes in a row. And Liquid has tried multiple ways to invade it. Um, this time around, the Leshrac had, was dead and had to buy back. And uh, had a ability to TP in to the outpost. But the fact that Aster finally does take the Roche seemed relatively inevitable. But the fact that Liquid forced them to invest so many buybacks and so many resources into getting this Roche means that now Liquid holds a bit of an advantage and Aster's five-man death ball timing slowed down by a few minutes and also slowed down in terms of net worth because Sniper was forced to invest a buyback in, as well as the Lushrak to getting this Aegis. Aster has basically set up fort in this part of the map while Team Liquid has mirrored it and taken the other half of the map. Uh, it's just really important to note once again that Aster and the teams against Liquid were consistently dictating where they wanted to play, and it was on Liquid to invade. It's really important to note that. So they've basically got this fort set up on the side of Aster, XSS the tank, purposely putting himself between where Liquid would be coming from and uh, the rest of his team. But what's so beautiful about this uh, from Liquid is exactly how they engage this fight. So we're gonna have to take it slow. And you'd think, why is Boxy and Matumbo Man going into the going into the frontliner? Like they can assume that Aster's set up here. Important to note that Aegis just expired. So this is like specific timing from Liquid. They're gonna run Matumbo Man and Boxy into XSS. They're gonna break smoke. Boxy's going to jump in blind just to supply his team with vision, popping ulti preemptively. Matumbo Man's gonna follow it up. But most importantly, Mickey took the opposite path. Like, Mickey did not go the same direction as they did. He set himself up to do, like, a somewhat wraparound on the rest of Aster, knowing that his job is to look for more. Notice how, Lick, uh, notice how Mickey completely ignores the Underlord. A lot of people would just hit the Underlord with their team trying to burst down the tanky guy. Mickey completely ignores him, goes to the back lines, forces attention drawn to himself, and goes after the ranged damage dealer in the back. That is so crucial to this type of thing working. If you have a ranged damage dealer like Drow or Sniper, and you've got this whole fort set up, then him dying basically ruins everything uh, for Aster and the team that has that setup. And it just ruins completely everything. They, they're the five-man setup. The whole point of everybody else in the five-man setup is to allow that guy to kill everybody. So the fact that they initiated a fight over here which dragged the sniper from over here to close enough to protect his underlord, because that's the sniper's job, is to hit the people that are hitting the underlord. Mickey then predicted it previous, prior to the fight even starting by taking this pathing, and then immediately went on the sniper. It was a combination of the perfect amount of resources to threaten the underlord, that sniper had to react, and then Mickey coming from around, him being the assassin responsible for killing the sniper, doing his job accordingly. So that's exactly how Liquid won game one. Uh, from here, they pretty much control the, the outcome of the game because Aster is no longer allowed to walk around the map as five. And we're going to hopefully, you guys will see the connection between how they won this game and exactly how they won uh, game three. So now that we've pulled into game three of Team Liquid versus Aster, we want to paint the same picture for you guys uh, with less explanation in this game because we already saw it in game one. But just so you can see the consistencies from game to game, for Team Liquid. So we're going to once again highlight the network distribution towards the tail end of the laning phase. You have Mickey and Matumba Man way up top, and then Zai, in this game even worse than usual, 
all the way at the bottom. And when we look at the map distribution, this is much more about how Liquid wanted to play. Last game, Mickey lost his lane. That we were, The last game we were looking at, Mickey lost his lane, so it wasn't as um, standard for them uh, in regards to how they wanted to play the map. But Matuma Man playing some uh, self-sufficient hero. Uh, Night Stalker's perfect for this because at five minutes plus, it's nighttime. He's ultra being chilling. And uh, the supports, like Insania in this case, going back to base in order to help mid. And Boxy already playing around mid. So pretty much most of their attention dedicated to Mickey in the mid lane. Uh, while the other two cores kind of do their own thing. Usually prioritizing a good start for Matu and not so for Zai. You can only win so many lanes, right? The other team's going to fight back. Early game team fights always happening around the mid lane. Mickey is going to get gone on by Ori. Very sick uh, preemptive stun by Mickey. That's actually going to turn the tides of this fight, delaying enough for Insania to connect, as well as Boxy, who's going back to base. And notice once again the four heroes involved on Liquid in this fight, and the one hero that is not Zai, in this case because he's having a really bad game, even though he is a team fighting hero. Matu always playing a carry who can rotate into mid and help like this. Uh, Lifestealer is really good at it. Bloodseeker is really good at it. Night Stalker is really good at it. And basically, it's like you're never killing Mickey for free, right? Liquid will always be able to bring the numbers to help their boy Mickey, and in this case, turning it into a nice tower take. In this case, two heroes from Aster still respawning. They always go for more. So in this case, Matu has rotated all the way from bottom to mid in order to take this fight. And since he's Night Stalker at nighttime, they're going to continue going for more. And they're going to rotate all the way to top lane. One of the few times that they make an early game rotation around Zai, but honestly, it has nothing to do with Zai's hero. It just has to do with the fact that Liquid's other three heroes are strong enough to make this move. They're going to dive like crazy, uh, assuming that Beastmaster has an offlaner who doesn't like to respond to this type of stuff will not. And always turning kills into more kills. Liquid's strat in a nutshell. So once again, the map distribution that we see that's kind of like a default for Liquid is Zai taking one side lane, Matu taking one side lane, and then the other three heroes playing around every single rune. Mickey died at the 10 minute rune. Um, it was a Night Stalker daytime and they didn't have any abilities. So even though they played this way at the 10 minute rune, uh, it wasn't good because they didn't have the ability to fight. But it's the same thing. You know, it's the same thing as always. This is what always happens on the map for Liquid. This is the way they played it. And uh, in this case... You know, they have the ability to respond on these other two. What made Zai so impactful for them is that even if he's having a bad game, he's always finding farm on the map, in this case, the super dangerous farm in the bottom half, and he's always managing to scrounge for whatever he can get. And uh, that's going to allow um, Night Stalker to take the ultra safe farm top and allow the two supports on Liquid to, to ensure that Mickey gets farm. As you see, this common net, net worth distribution from Liquid once again. So what's really cool about this game as well is that Liquid's going to do the same thing. Aster's controlling the jungle, kind of dictating where they want to play. And Liquid's going to smoke up in order to invade, especially because Matumbo Man has ultimate and he's nearby. And they're going to look in their own jungle. This is effectively booting uh, Aster out of the jungle. Notice how Aster's like kind of aware of this. They back off. And then Liquid could pursue for more, but I feel like they kind of learned their lesson from the first game, where if they try to take a fight that's not natural, in this case, like, Aster's clearly set up around here, Zai broke, uh, Night Stalker from a Tumman still in the bottom lane, which is not nearly as close to the fight that could have occurred here. And they're just going to accept that, like, this smoke amounted to nothing, right? Zai's like, yes, confirmed, the entire enemy team is in their triangle, and we're just going to take nothing. Um, which is a really cool adjustment in Game 3 from Liquid. I feel like they were always kind of trying to force things whenever they smoked up um, in a lot of their other series. So being able to say, no, let's not take this fight, really cool adjustment. So kind of the same thing here. They are smoked up, trying to take a fight where they saw that Aster's uh, Beastmaster was bottom. They're going to look for a kill. It doesn't work. And instead of like over-pursuing or forcing a kill, they're just going to turn around and use this Night Stalker ultimate to secure a Roshan, right? So they're constantly using their cooldowns constantly pushing Aster away, but not also not chasing into them, not forcing too much. And then Aster's going to kind of catch on to this, saying, like, Night, Star, Night Stalker Ultimate's expiring. Uh, we should try to catch the tail end of it and maybe contest this Roshan, especially if Aster's able to take a fight when Roshan dies already and Night Stalker's Ultimate is out. So what's so cool about this is that Insania held nothing back. He used his Tombstone as well as his ultimate immediately, knowing like, hey, we're on a timer. We need to take this Roche before Night Stalker ulti expires. And Zai is like, okay, guys, I'm on distraction duty. It's my time to buy some time, making sure that the support Naga is not in range to sing uh, and sleep the rest of Liquid, ensuring that Aster can take the Roche. So it's so cool how they approach this fight. Just the right amount of damage and resources expended in order to get the Roche on. 
Zai buying time for his team, forcing re forcing uh, abilities to be used on him. And uh, even though this fight's not going to go all that great for Liquid, like they're going to end up dropping the Aegis um, on Mickey and then dying twice, Matu ends up getting away. And all things considered, I would think this is a very important denial Aegis because the five-man power of Aster, similar to game one, uh, if Aster had gotten this Aegis, it would have been the exact same story, where Liquid would have had to dodge fights for five minutes in a row, they probably lose all their tier two towers to the group up push of Aster, and the fact that they basically traded even while losing the Aegis uh, is a huge win for Liquid because of this uh, whole idea of uh, making sure that they have as much time as possible to choose when they take that fight to Aster. I think they kind of caught Aster with their pants down. Uh, Aster wasn't quite connected on the CM yet. He was connecting to this bottom push. Very similar story to game one, right? Aster's trying to take this time in the game to push tier two tower with their, uh, with their aura based offlaner uh, invading in. And Liquid's basically gonna be like, even though we don't have Lina, we have Pango Roll coming up. We have Night Stalker. Uh, nighttime, even though he doesn't have BKB yet. Honestly, looking at this, if I'm Aster, I don't think I would have thought Liquid would fight me either. No, no Lina, um, no Undying ulti, no Night Stalker ulti, no BKB on Night Stalker. But this is a really cool choice, um, where Liquid doesn't quite think that they're set up yet because the Primal Beast is pushing a lane over here, and they're gonna catch Aster briefly split up where they weren't in their ball just yet. No counter initiation from the Naga available because the sleep was used at Roche, and... That's going to allow Liquid to push off, or ward off, Aster from this tier 2 tower. And these games really are like, as long as you're not taking our towers with your group up push lineup on Aster, uh, we're always going to have the favorable engagements on the side of Liquid. So here we go again. <laughs> Same recipe as always. Liquid is smoked up. Aster's grouped as four. Pushing a tower, controlling a hill with a ward. And we're going to see exactly how this Night Stalker carry hero played into how Liquid won this game. So what's going to happen is their initiation tactic, because Pango is so low on the net worth, doesn't really have like, uh, all he has is a blink, right? Uh, nothing more powerful than that. Their initiation tactic is from a Tumble Man to push R and run the hell in. So we're going to see he breaks his smoke, instantly pops his ultimate. He's going to BKB right as he gets roared which means that he's not going to be able to take any damage during the war. Also, this is like a brief educational tidbit on viewers asking why did that guy buy BKB against BKB piercing disables? Because BKB also blocks a lot of damage, especially from a hero like Primal Beast. So even though Matu got stunned, he's still doing his job in the fight. They've got the Tombstone. They're instantly killing the Wraith Pact as well as the Ward on the high ground. And Liquid basically forcing a chaotic fight where the opponent's five-man ball has been dispersed, and that's going to lead to another favorable engagement for them. Honestly confusing that Ori tried to go back in and fight there. The chase potential from Liquid is immense, and they're going to use Song to disengage. But the fact that Liquid broke their ball there is just so important, and it was simply done by this Night Stalker giving them flying vision, being super tanky, and forcing spells onto himself without dying. It's important to see this type of stuff during the game, is that when Liquid's not quite ready to fight, uh, in this case, like Night Stalker Ultimates on cooldown, notice how they're placed in front of their towers together with enough heroes while farming on Mickey, so they're like playing pretty efficiently, basically just stalling, you know, so that the fights that they have, it's not just that they're taking the fights that they, they want to take, but the what they're doing in the time that they are not capable of fighting is like really important, right? So they use Fortification, Zai blinks in and clears, clears this wave really quickly, and that's going to effectively defend the tower when they don't want to fight, and now they're now able to fight um, if they so choose. 15 seconds later, all their abilities on Liquid are back up. Mickey has rotated in from top lane, no longer farming, and they are three-man smoked to the two guys defending the tower. Asher's going to take the tower, forcing an engagement. But Insania, sim doing the job of Matumba Man, basically, the dangler, the guy that's forcing them to cost spells, uh, managed to get his tombstone off before he got locked down by the Primal Beast, which was absolutely essential. And then Liquid's going to turn that into another, basically saying, you can't stay in your five-man ball. It's pretty much impossible to just group up and not let a Night Stalker run into you, right? That's always going to happen. So Night Stalker, really, honestly, a five-head pick for the sake of the dynamic of this series. You know, I wouldn't think Night Stalker carry on average is a good pick, 
but you're seeing how impactful it is for simply breaking up and dispersing the Aster heroes, such that this five-man ball is no longer the same potency that it normally has. I also want to show you guys that after that fight, Liquid managed to turn this into a tower, and what's really important about this tower is that you want to force Aster to respond to you. Basically, you got to think about it this way. Liquid has no cooldowns, meaning none of their stuff is available. Like, they are not ready to fight in the slightest. So, like, the perfect way for Liquid to play this, if possible, is to for force enough pressure on this tower that Aster thinks they can get a fight off of it, but they can't. That's the perfect recipe. You know, if you leave too early, then Aster doesn't bring all their heroes here. If you leave too late, then you give Aster the fight that they want. So Liquid, look at how Zai is kind of scouting out the flank path, is going to immediately back the second that Aster is alive, managing to take the tower, and they're just like, see ya, we're not fighting. So it also forced the rest of Aster, who thought they could get there with the Naga sleep and set up, um, to be on this part of the map, which is going to allow a daytime Night Stalker to safely farm a lane, and also play into the fact that when Liquid's not ready to fight, they are able to play the map in a way where they're not forced to. Uh, Roshan, Liquid... Had drawn out enough time, they've got all their ultimates again, plop down the tombstone, undying ulti, commit to the Roche. Zai knows it's his job to buy some time for the team. He's gonna go ahead and roll up and play distraction mode. And basically every fight, Liquid has a dangler. You know, they have some guy that's forcing all the spells from Aster so that their five-man death ball is not actually deadly. It's just locking you down. So Zai is gonna put himself in the middle of the fight. Buying himself a Lotus for the net from Naga. The Ag's net goes through his roll, so he's got the Lotus. Really good itemization from him. As you see, he's locked down, but then he's going to Lotus himself so he can move. And just buying enough time, drawing out enough skills to effectively make it so Aster cannot take the fight that they want. And now Liquid's able to chase on the tail end and get exactly what their lineup wants, which is a chaotic fight where Aster is forced to run away. And even though Drow is this ranged damage dealer, he's spending the entire fight running away. So he just doesn't have the same potency that he normally has. And this was such great execution in the mid game from Liquid. All these little maneuvers to stall out Aster, to force Aster to respond and then not give them the fight that they want and then take fight on their own terms with a specific recipe to break up the ball of Aster. And that's why I thought this Night Stalker pick was so genius after watching it. I was just like, you know, I'm one of the people that's like healthily skeptical. Like, are they really picking carry Night Stalker in an elimination game at TI for third, fourth place? But you can see how beautiful it was. And not only because it was good in this specific game, but it's almost like this is how we've been playing for this entire tournament. And this is how Aster likes to play. And this hero fits the mold of the type of hero Matumba Man's been playing, more of like an enabling carry that rotates to fights in the mid-game, and also counters this five-man death ball, um, especially in the form of Beastmaster Drow, because Beastmaster gets vision from his summons, especially the Hawks, and Night Stalker is like the best vision hero in the entire game. And then Night Stalker's teamfight contribution is literally run at the opponent, and Drow is very different than most other ranged heroes, where it's not actually required of you to kill the drow as long as you are running at the drow making her retreat she's not going to do enough damage like when it comes to sniper if you get next to him but then you don't really kill him he'll turn around and kill you right because it doesn't matter how close you are to sniper he'll do the same amount of damage but with drow if you're within that radius of her of her ultimate then she's literally does no damage so you can just get in that radius and then not hit her and so that's really cool is then usually when you see drow lineups you have to kill the drow because you can't stay on her for long enough. But the Night Stalker served this purpose of scaring the Drow away from these fights such that they had all the time in the world that they needed to kill the other tanky heroes in this five-man ball, basically just ignoring the Drow every single fight. So that was uh, really cool to watch. Uh, this is Liquid Strat pretty much throughout all of TI. Kind of like every team we watch ever in TI, they kind of like refine their approach, adjust and like figure out the best way to do it. And where they end up usually tells us like how good that approach was at TI. So I really emphasize that Liquid was the out of the final four teams, the one fighting against the grain of uh, what the meta really was. But I think they did it insanely well. And you can see how carefully calculated each of these approaches to the team fights were. And also how well they understood their individual roles on the map. And you can see the way that they like to play the map. So I hope you guys enjoyed this analysis. That's Team Liquid. 
for TI-11. My next video coming out tomorrow will be for Team Secret, followed by an analysis video of Tundra, our TI-11 champions, uh, the following day. So thanks for watching, guys. Like, comment, subscribe. See you, nerds.